Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The gingival recession on this patient's right central incisor is the result of a flap procedure performed in conjunction with a retrograde root canal filling. A shallow gingival crevice surrounds both the lateral and central incisors. The labial frenum attachment does not pull on the free gingiva. After the area has been anesthetized, in preparation for a lateral sliding flap, the initial incision is made with a Bard Parker No. 12B blade. The purpose of this incision is to excise the cravicular side of the free gingiva on the labial aspect of the tooth. The scalpel is directed toward the bottom of the gingival crevice. A second incision is made along the labial surface of the tooth at the bottom of the gingival crevice. This separates the free gingiva from the tooth. The excised free gingiva is then removed with a curette and the bottom of the gingival crevice curetted to eliminate any remaining epithelial cells. The remaining mesial portion of the gingival crevice is now excised. This area is also curetted to assure complete removal of the epithelium. A vertical releasing incision is started at the mesiobuccal aspect of the patient's right cuspid. The incision is extended through the attached gingiva and into the alveolar mucosa. Another incision is made along the distal aspect of the central incisor and also extended into the alveolar mucosa. The final incision to free the gingiva from the lateral incisor is made along the bottom of the gingival crevice and carried down to the alveolar process on the labial aspect of the tooth.
The curette is again used to free any residual attachments. The mucoperiosteal flap is raised with a plastic instrument used as a mucoperiosteal elevator. The tissue should be handled carefully in order to avoid any crushing or tearing effect which would interfere with the blood supply. As the flap is moved toward the central incisor, slight resistance is encountered indicating tissue tension. Therefore, it is necessary to extend the releasing incision at the distal aspect of the flap. The incision is carried through the periosteum to facilitate the flap adaptation. A thorough root planing is performed on the labial surface of the central incisor to facilitate the attachment of the flap. The lateral incisor is also planed slightly to assure good flap adaptation and healing. A 5-0 silk suture is placed through the mesial aspect of the flap using a fine atraumatic needle. The flap is gently drawn to the desired position. One end of the suture is carefully pulled through the contact of the central incisors. Then the other end is also drawn through the contact so that both ends of the suture are on the palatal aspect. One end of the suture is pulled through the interproximal space between the left central and lateral incisors and the other end between the lateral incisor and cuspid. As the ends of the suture are tied, the flap is drawn mesially and palatally. Another suture is placed through the mesial incisal corner of the flap to improve its adaptation to the adjacent tissues. Both ends of this suture are carried through the contact of the central incisors to the palatal side. One end is then drawn through the left central lateral incisor contact back to the labial side and the other end of the suture through the right central lateral contact. Their ends are drawn together and tied so that there is a slight pull on the flap.
Still another suture is placed through the distal aspect of the flap and carried to the palatal side through the right central lateral contact. Again, both ends are brought to the labial side and tied so that the distal aspect of the flap is closely adapted to the central and lateral incisors. There is an unavoidable area of denuded bone between the right lateral and cuspid. However, the bone which covers the labial surfaces of these teeth is not denuded. The position of the sutures can be seen in this palatal view. Two and one half percent acromycin ointment is placed over the denuded bone and sutures to lessen the chance of infection. Tin foil is then placed over the area of the surgery and adapted to the teeth and soft tissues. A periodontal dressing is placed into the interproximal area to hold the dressing in place. It will also hold the flap and tin foil in a well adapted position. A surgical dressing is placed over the entire area of surgery and extended to the neighboring teeth. The patient's lip is used to mold the dressing. The dressing must not interfere with the mucobuccal fold and labial frenum. The sutures have been removed one week post-operatively. The small amount of denuded bone not covered with granulation tissue is coated with the antibiotic ointment and a new surgical dressing is applied. Four weeks post-operatively, the free gingival margin appears to be in normal position and the aesthetic result is excellent. The gingival crevice is shallow, indicating that the flap has gained attachment to the labial surface of the tooth. Both aesthetic and functional repair have been obtained. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.